had a doc, had a, 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 a thing that went against Pauline doctrine. Yeah. We have nothing. We have literally nothing which says Paul was preaching something which is completely alien to what we were preaching. كن فريدا عش بفخر في الحياة لا تبالي فالمعالي بالتحدي لا سوى كن سعيدا Worshiper. Paul's not an idol worshiper, he says. So don't do it out of for, the, for their consideration, out of consideration for their views. He's not saying he can't eat it, but this is in violation of the apostolic decree in Matthew uh, in Acts 15. Do you not see the logic of that? I do see how you, you can interpret that, but I'm still. Well, how do you interpret it then? Because I'm just trying to read in context. Because above, above that in this verse, which verse? Paul, sorry, that, the verse that we just read above it. So he's still in chapter 10. Okay. Uh, so he, he's really saying people to refrain from idolatry. Yeah. But it's strange that he's saying refrain from idolatry, but you still can, in good conscience, partake in um, eating food that has been offered to idols. Yeah. But he's saying refrain from idolatry. Wouldn't that also then sort of uh, focus in our interpretation to say it can't be what you're saying because what he's contradicting himself. But, but no, I do. I do no, he, he makes sense. He, no, no, he makes Why sense. Why from idolatry? Let me, let me ask yeah. you. But if someone says to you, Paul, this has been offered in sacrifice, then do not eat it. Why shouldn't they eat it? Why, why shouldn't Paul or his writers eat it? What does Paul say? Can you say that verse again? Sorry, I was just okay. looking through. So it's verse 28. Yeah. Paul says, but if someone says to you the reader of this or hear of this letter, this has been offered in sacrifice, then do not eat it. What's the reason why they shouldn't eat it, according to Paul? No, 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 no. Yes. It's not what it says. Let's read what it says. Yes. Then do not eat it out of consideration for the one who informed you and for the sake of conscience. I mean, Paul says, for the other's conscience, not for your own. Why should my liberty be subjected to the judgment of yes. someone else's conscience? If I partake with thankfulness, why should I be denounced because of that for which I give thanks? Um, so whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, give ever, give glory to God. Yes. So what he's saying is, you don't eat it if it's going to cause offence to someone else, but you can eat it in your own conscience. This goes against the the apostolic decree, which says that Gentiles period should not eat food sacrificed to idols. He's going way beyond that. He's giving permission because obviously if you're if you as a private person go along uh, as a Christian and eat food sacrificed to idols there's no objection. If you eat it on your own, if you have a, a sac an idol sandwich behind a rock somewhere, yeah. <laughs> um, to give a silly example, yeah. a Monty Python example, yes. um, there's no objection uh, g given uh, in terms of Paul's own but stipulations, say in, except that it would violate the Apostles' But wouldn't you then say in 31 there is a, where it says, so whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do all for the glory of God. Mm. And so if I am eating food offered to idols, I'm not doing that to the glory of God, am I? Knowingly eating of food that's been offered as sacrifice. No, be, be, because, I'm not doing it for the glory. Because the, glory the whole of argument of chapter 8 says about these idols, they, they, no idol in the world really exists. And there is no Which, God but one. So, so he says basically it's all a load of tosh. These idols don't exist. You're free to eat the, eat the food and so on. But for the sake of others' consciences who may think you are participating in idol worship or you, or, or you may be validating that worship, don't do it if you're with an unbeliever. But if you're having a private idol sandwich behind the shed, to give a silly example, there's obviously no objection because the liberty. So he said, take care. He talks about his liberty. Now, they had the liberty yeah, so to eat saying, it. Yes. So he's saying, you're. He was then speaking about the conscience here, and he said, yeah. I do not mean your conscience, but his, for why should my liberty be determined as someone else's conscience? Yeah, yeah. If I partake with thankfulness, why am I denounced because of that for which I'm thankful? Yeah. So, whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. That's right. Okay. But then, still again, for me, that would negate. If I knowingly am eating something which is um, being offered to idols, I will not be doing it to the glory of God. Because I think that's easily the reason. Because yeah, but, 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 why, did, why did they give that requirement in the book of Acts? In the book of Acts? No, but Paul deals with this. Food offered to idols. Let's go back to the beginning. Now concerning food sacrificed to idols. We all know, uh, we all possess knowledge. This is obviously a gnostic -y kind of thing he's okay. criticising. You know, the key word being knowledge, gnosis in Greek. Knowledge puffs up, love builds up. Anyone who claims to... Okay, leave that bit. It's all about... Yeah. Back to verse 4. Hence, 
as to the eating of food offers to idols, we know that no idol in the world really exists. And there is no one but God, or no God but one. Indeed, even though there may be so-called gods in heaven or on earth, as in fact there may be many gods and lords, yet there for us there is one God, the Father, from whom all things come and through whom we exist, blah, blah, blah. So he said to say, Our idols just don't exist for him. It, it, it's all a, a load of nonsense. They don't exist, just like all the other so-called gods and lords. There's only one God, the Father. Not Jesus, obviously, but God, interestingly. And food, he says, it's not everyone, however, who has this knowledge that idols just don't exist. They have no consequence. Since some have become so accustomed to idols until now, they still think of the food that they eat as food offered to an idol. They still think that, but we know they don't exist, but they think that. And their conscience, which is weak, is defiled. Food, however, doesn't bring us close to God. We are no worse off if we do not eat or if we do eat. But we've got to take care that this liberty of ours, this freedom to eat what we want, the idols not existing, does not become a stumbling block to the weak, to the weak Christians. Yeah? For if others see you, but who possess knowledge, eating in the temple of an idol, might they not, since they have a weak conscience, be encouraged to the point of eating food sacrificed to idols themselves? So by your knowledge, your knowledge that these idols don't exist, it's all a load of bunkum, you destroy the faith. Uh, so by I, your I knowledge... Don't, I, I don't uh, agree with that reading, on 11. So, so let, me, let, let me read, I didn't read the verse. Yeah, so by your knowledge, those weak believers for whom Christ died are destroyed, from whom uh, yeah, there's a footnote there at the bottom that says that. So, but, that is, but thus you are sinning against members of the family and wound the con their conscience when it is weak and you sin against Christ. Therefore, if food is the cause of their falling, I will never eat meat, in fact, so that I may not cause one of them okay. to fall. But he, see, the, the argument is obviously he knows that there are no idols. They do not exist, he says. Indeed, even the, even the so-called gods in heaven or on earth but in fact, for us, there is one God, and that he is the Father. So he's saying, nevertheless, our, our freedom, our liberty to eat all this stuff might jeopardize a fellow believer's faith who doesn't have this strong conscience. They have a weak faith that may be destroyed by our actions. They may be destroyed by our actions. Now, th th this is actually good pastoral yeah, practice. Isn't he saying that the act of eating that and them seeing that is what's going to destroy them? If they have a weak, if they have a weak conscience, because they don't understand the liberty that they have to eat this stuff, actually, because as he established at the beginning, there are no idols. He says in verse four, as to the eating of food offered to idols, we know that no idol in the world really exists, and there is no god but one. Yeah. So, so the fact is, no, this is all, this is all fiction. It's all myth. It's all rubbish. Okay, one yeah. So, for if anyone sees you who have knowledge eating in an idol's temple. Yep. Will he not be encouraged if his conscience is weak to eat food offered to idols? Indeed, indeed. Okay. Indeed. Um, and so by this, your knowledge. Yeah. So by your knowledge, this weak person destroyed the brother from whom Christ died. Exactly. And so if someone who does not believe in idol work and idols, which he's saying, he sorry, so, sorry, someone who doesn't believe in the existence of idols. Right. Like Paul, like he, who has the liberty to eat these okay, foods. Like he said, he doesn't believe in idols. So he, 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 he believe, has freedom to eat these foods. Okay, one second. Because he believes yeah. there's one God. Yeah. Okay. So and he's known as that person who believes, doesn't believe in idols, believes that it's yeah. one God. Yeah. Okay. He can eat but the then food. he's seen... <coughs> but he can eat the food, can't he? No, one second. Then he's seen mm -hmm. eating... Yeah. No, but then he's seen eating in this temple. Mm. He's then given authority to those idols, isn't he? That's why the person will stumble well, with their weak He's not giving authority. He, he, may, he may be perceived by the other person wrongly. Yes, exactly. So, so he's not giving authority sorry, to sorry, yes. So the person is seeing and yeah, believing yeah. that he's giving yeah. authority to these oh, oh, yeah. he's eating. So then he's doing the wrong thing by Absolutely. doing that. Absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. But by eating off the idols. Yeah, but, but, but in that context, but only in that context, Paul has said, uh, he talks about the liberty of his to eat this food. He says in verse 8 that he has a liberty to eat this food, but because of the weak conscience of others who may misunderstand, because they don't have the true knowledge that Paul says he has, they may think that he is participating I don't think in idol worship. He's saying, himself. He's saying us. He said food will not commend us to God. Yeah. Well, so, I mean, he's obviously saying yeah, I'm, everyone I'm, else. He's not just saying yes. his own position. No, but, but, but Paul, yeah. is, Paul is saying that he has liberty, therefore, by default. Everyone else, uh, gen all Gentile Christians, have freedom to eat food sacrificed to idols with all these huge caveats, as long as they're not undermining anyone's faith, some of the weak conscience is not negatively affected by it. But in himself, he has a liberty to eat it. Why would a person be negatively affected?
affected by that if they have a weak conscience. But well, what does Paul say? For if others see you who possess knowledge, for if, if, if others see you, Paul or his readers, who possess knowledge, i.e., you know, they're educated Christians, eating in the temple of an idol, might not they, since their conscience is weak, be encouraged to the point of eating food sacrificed to idols? Okay. So, so, so they, then they, they why become, is that then a problem? Well, it's a problem because they may believe idols are real. So it's not the main issue then? Well, that's, that, 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 that's see, the main issue. So the, 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 these are Gentile people in, in Corinth who have been brought up to worship idols. Yeah, they're, they're, they're pagan Gentiles. Routinely in the Roman Empire, everyone sacrificed to idols, obviously, to the emperor, every, everyone. Paul, as a good Jew, and Christians after him, don't recognize the reality. They don't really exist. They're, 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 they're nothing. They don't exist. So the people have knowledge, I Paul, and they're like, can eat freely because there are no idols really to, to be worried about. But the but Gentile believers whose conscience is weak, in other words, who don't have a fully formed knowledge, uh, Paul says that they, they don't have uh, knowledge, will think actually that Paul, who has the knowledge, is somehow validating idol worship and, and acknowledging they exist by so, by participating so in then, this. Don't you think that matches up then with Acts 15? No. Because then Absolutely the call not. is not to eat to idols, and then it can be because if you do eat to idols, sorry, eat uh, food offered to idols, then you will be affecting other people who have that weak conscience, mm. and so that's why that's given up. No. But the, no, but isn't that what he's saying? He's saying if you eat food offered to idols in front of someone with a weak conscience, they will then slip up and also eat these things when they shouldn't be. And the why they shouldn't be is because they're giving authority to things which do not exist because there is only one God and one Lord Jesus right. Christ. So you're, so, you're, so, you're, so you're accepting there are, are circumstances when Gentile Christians can eat food sacrificed to idols? Well, I think... No, but that's the logic of what you're saying. Yes. So I think what Paul and, and that validates get, the sorry that that yes. violates the apostolic decree. So I think I think what Paul was trying point. to yeah what Paul was yeah but we then have to ask why did the apostles they didn't give us enough information to no. say why yeah. did they say don't eat food right. offered to idols right. we don't have enough context I think you see you see to say that because so, then we could then read it and then say Paul is saying the reason why we shouldn't do it is because you'll be affecting other Christians who have that weak conscience see but Paul is going way 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 beyond anything that the council says. No, but the, I mean the, the council, we don't have the context of why they specifically Well, we, we do, because... Do the, the, these, food, no, we do. The context the is the Jewish law, the Jewish prohibition of eating blood, the Jewish prohibition of eating strangled meat, the Jewish prohibition of fornication, uh, which is all there in Islam as well, of course. These are the Noahide laws, if you like, that apply to Gentiles. They're not negotiable. You can't think, well, I don't know you're not, you're not saying this, but an imaginary interlocutor that as Paul says you know don't commit it says don't commit, commit fornication I ah, yes but fornication as I've known it is a is a, is a unpleasant brutal it's when the slave master uh, commits fornication with it you know I'm practicing fornication in a loving way I, I'm having a sensitive you know loving uh, fornication so actually you can commit fornication in this way because the fornication this is referring to is clearly the, the Gentile, you know what I mean? This is, this is playing uh, fast and loose with the apostolic decree, which is rooted in Judaism. These are the Noahide laws. Uh, you see, Muslims are prohibited from eating pork. It's not like we can spin this and say, oh well, oh well this, oh well that, and then eat pork. The prohibition is actually. Uh, and, and what Paul is doing is, if he is, he's, he's doing a, a hermeneutical move which results actually in the widespread acceptance of eating food sacrificed to idols in direct violation of the apostolic decree. He, he's being the maverick well, I mean, that he is uh, accused of. I don't think of. it's fair to say he's being the maverick. It's just, okay, conciliar decisions are extremely important, obviously. But won't we also say that apostles have certain authority as well to interpret conciliar decisions? So we have this conciliar decision here, do not eat this. Paul is saying, do not eat this in certain circumstances. He's not authorised to do that. But, I mean, we don't... But He's not authorised to do that. Really? Is yeah, no, 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 really, because if you look at um, verse 28 of Acts 15, okay. James, who's the, head of the, who's the head of the church, he's the first pope, in, in effect, not Peter, James gives this ruling, for it seemed good 
to the Holy Spirit and to us, this is the council, to impose on you Gentiles no further burden than these essentials. Now, this is the authority. I mean, you, you have a more Catholic understanding of Christianity, and I think you're, intellectually you're much more, it's a much more plausible understanding. Yeah. Oh, this is a separate issue, but I, I heard you speak. Much more credible, in my view. So, we're dealing here with an ecumenical council of all the apostles, and Paul, one individual, is going off. It's not that he's doing pastoral hermeneutics. He's failing to mention the council at all. He's not talking about the decree. He's ignoring the decree. Then can I just go to this verse where, end of 29, it says, if you keep yourselves from these, you will do well. Yeah. There's a conditional there. Yeah. There's a conditional if you do this. Yeah. He's not saying you must do this. Well. It says it, no, but I mean, come on. There's a reason that it must be a conditional. If you do these, you'll do well. But let's say with sexual immorality, that's something which has been further refined that we have commandments within the apostolic teaching. Yeah. But we don't find that in here because I'm thinking that obviously, I mean, we're just you know going off of each other. But I'm saying that the authority of the council is extremely important. And there's also the authority of apostles to interpret it in certain con contexts. Is that, say, but, but where does authority come from? Well, I, I must say that... I know, reason, I know it's a yeah. Catholic doctrine, but we're talking yes. about first century yes. uh, Judaism, uh, Judaism. We're not talking about yes. ecumenical council. But I mean, we must, say, we must say that the apostles have authority. Not, it, no, they it's, they it's, do, it's, wouldn't you say? But Paul does not have authority over, an ecumenic, over James. No, so I'm, over not saying, I'm not saying he does, but then we have also Paul um, stating in Galatians that what he was preaching ah, yes. was, you know, acceptable to the ears of these people. Well, this is what he claims, yes. Yeah, I mean, that's what he claims. Uh, uh, that uh, is uh, acceptable to these people. I'm not sure it was, actually. Uh, but I mean, because don't it, have it, any textual evidence which says Paul was right. I mean, we should, that would be so useful if, you know, let's say someone who was against Christianity, such as um, Salus or whatever his name in the second century, had a doc had a, a, a thing that went against Pauline doctrine. Yeah. We have nothing. We have literally nothing which says Paul was preaching something which is completely alien to what we were preaching. I don't know. Oh, oh, we, we, we do. We have lots of evidence. Really? Oh, oh masses of evidence. Really? Yeah. Really. Yeah. No, no. But I'm, I'm being honest. No, no. Really, there. really. Well, I, I come back to thinking. I just want to come back. This is a very good point, and yes. this is a juicy subject, and I do want to yes. come back to it. But I just want to come back to Paul's attitude to uh, the other apostles. Uh, yeah, uh, uh, about about his uh, about his gospel yes. uh, as well. Um, he he boasts or he says that he received his gospel uh, directly from God. He did not confer with any human being, as Galatians chapter one verse sixteen. Nor did I go up to Jerusalem to those who were already apostles before me, but I went off away to Arabia and afterwards went uh, to Damascus. And uh, he says in verse. Uh, says 18, then I, after three years I went up to Jerusalem to visit Cephas and remained within 15 days. Yes. So I saw none of the other apostles except James, the Lord's brother. What I'm writing to you before God, I do not lie. Then I went into the region of Syria and Sicilia, and I was still unknown in person to the church of Judea, that in Christ, there only were hearing it said, he who used to persecute us is now preaching the faith yes. he wants to try to destroy. Right. And they glorified God because of me. Right. And then so he goes on in... It's actually verse 11. Yes, so you're right, as well. He says, I want you to know, brothers and sisters, uh, that the gospel that was proclaimed to, by me is not of human origin. Uh, for I did not receive it from a human source, nor was I taught it, but I received it through a revelation of Jesus Christ. Um, and he talks earlier, later on about the so-called uh, 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 so pillars in Jerusalem, meaning James and Peter and John. So he's very much an independent, what I would call a maverick figure. What the gospel that he preached was different uh, in many ways from two other gospels. He talks about the, um, I'm astonished that you are so quickly deserting the one who called you in the grace of Christ and are turning to a different gospel. So other gospels in the marketplace of ideas, he says there's not another gospel, but there clearly were other gospels. Um, the, 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 other, the, the other gospels, he, his gospel is different from the gospel of James, and gospels are different, and it's different, then, most importantly, from the gospel of Jesus. Are you sure? Because if we go to Galatians 2, mm -hmm. yep. it says, then after 14 years, so it's carrying on, I went up again to Jerusalem with Barnabas, taking Titus along with me. I went up because of a revelation set before them, through, um, though privately, 
before those who seemed influential. The gospel that I proclaimed among the Gentiles in order to make sure I was not running or had not run in vain. I mean, that's someone who is conscious of what he's doing. I think it's not like uh, he's just going around. He, saying, no, no maybe, maybe he believes that, but well, we can test uh, his claims, and the evidence, unfortunately, contradicts Paul's claim. And the evidence is this: it's twofold. Again, this is my interpretation of what Paul taught and what James and the apostles taught. Uh, Paul taught a law-free gospel. In Romans chapter 7, the whole chapter is given over to an argument about how, an analogy with human marriage, how a woman, when she's married to a man while he's alive, she may not legally marry another. When he dies, this is an analogy, the law dies, the law is over, then she may marry another. She is free to marry, which is obviously Christ. So the, the point being here that the law now is a dispensation that is, is passed and that, that uh, those who live by the Spirit of God are, not, are no longer under the law. And he makes that clear in a number of places, in Romans and Galatians uh, and in Ephesians, where he says, Ephesians 2.15, uh, that the law with its regulations and commandments has been abolished. That is the exact wording of the NRSV, good scholarly translation. Um, now, I know the reading... I, I'm aware in the academic world that the interpretation of Paul and the law is extremely controversial and scholars disagree. It seems to me like as many scholars are interpretations of Paul's understanding of the law. So, I, 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 my view is in Romans 7, for example, Paul is clearly talking about the, uh, the abrogation of the law, if you like. It's no longer an operative thing for you. Don't live, he's not, as a Jew, living under the law anymore. Which means, in a sense, he's apostatized. He's, he's like a Muslim saying, I'm not going to live under the Sharia anymore, I'm going to do my own thing. Where you can't, as a result of a revelation of Hafez Muhammad or something, you can't do that. Um, now, what did James believe? So we've got, we've got Paul on the one side, that's my reading, a law free gospel, uh, uh, and he's no longer under the law himself, the, the, uh, uh, the, the Mosaic law. Uh, what did James say? Now, we know from James, uh, James is a historical figure and is a a witness to a, his kind of Christianity it has been airbrushed out of most of Christian history and it's only very recently that uh, scholars have rediscovered the historical James, James the, James the Just, James the Great. Um, and uh, a number of recent books like by James Tabor and Jeffrey Bartz uh, and others have discussed uh, the historical figure of James and his significance for today's world in terms of relations between Islam and Christianity and Judaism. It's quite interesting. Um, and the James that we, that of history seems to be someone who was a Torah-observant Jew, who was zealous for the law, as Acts says, he's zealous for the law. Uh, Acts has James boasting to Paul about all these Pharisees. Uh, look how zealous for the law they are. They're coming into, into the community. Uh, we know from Josephus, the uh, Jewish historian from Jerusalem, first century, uh, that James was a highly regarded Jewish leader uh, in Jerusalem for decades until he died in the 60s. And he, and he was known as a, a James the Just because of his, his Jewish piety, actually. We know from Eusebius, the church historian, who quotes a second century Jewish bishop, Hesepicus, I mispronounced him, um, again giving us more information about how the, the exalted status that James, not Peter, James had in the early church in Jerusalem. And he, was, uh, he wasn't a Christian, James. There was no Christianity for James. There was Judaism. He was uh, a follower of the Messiah. He was his brother, Je uh, Jesus. But he hadn't broken with Judaism. He, he remained a Jew who was respected. And this is the really crucial point that Josephus mentions, that James was highly respected because he was killed in the end. He was murdered. And, J and, and Josephus says, how many of the respected leaders of the Jew of Judaism in Jerusalem were outraged that uh, James should be, who was an upstanding upholder of the law. This is the Jewish law, yeah? And James was the head of the church. We know that, uh, according to various sources, he was either appointed or elected by Peter and John and someone else, I forget who, uh, to be uh, the first pope, the first bishop, if, uh, if you like, of Rome, uh, of, uh, Rome of Jerusalem, Freudian slip. So the Christianity, he, he wasn't a Christian in the Pauline sense who had said the law had been abolished. What he seemed to have preached was essentially Judaism with a focus on Jesus as the Messiah, who had come, uh, obviously, in the person of Jesus, died, rose again, and then would return again soon. Yeah, he would return again. Um, 
there's no sense that uh, Jesus was God for James. There's no sense that um, Paul's unique theories of atonement through a, a sacrificial death on the cross uh, would have been acceptable to James because he was a Torah observant Jew. And so you attended, you attend sacrifices in the temple. And we know they carried on attending sacrifices in the temple after Jesus disappeared to heaven, because it says so in Acts. It says on the th at the third hour, they went to pray, but there was no prayer like a church. This is the hour of sacrifice. And we know this from multiple historical sources. So the, the disciples, Jesus' own disciples, I'm not being Paul, but Jesus carried on being Torah observant, faithful Jews observing the law. They didn't teach what Paul taught. And you get the sense in Galatians and elsewhere of, of, of the friction, the schism. And Jimmy Dunn, the evangelical biblical scholar, talks about the, the huge schism that exists in the earliest church between Paul on the one hand and James and his group of Jerusalem uh, Jewish followers, Christians on the other. Uh, I, I, the Judaizers than, than James. Yeah, the, 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 it doesn't really say James. It's more saying the Judaizers. But. But, you, but, 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 men, but men, so to sure, men came from James, Paul says, to sort Peter out because uh, Peter was, uh, you know, sharing table with Gentiles and so on. So there was clearly a friction. So I think Paul, Paul was a, a, an egotist. He was a maverick who, who really only was faithful to his uh, Christ vision, his mystical Christ vision that he had, and that for him reinterpreted everything. Everything was changed. But, but, for, but for people who knew Jesus, the historical Jesus. These people continued, and therefore, because of what James did, we know what Jesus did. Because James taught obedience to the law, we know that Jesus would have taught Torah observance as well. And therefore, we know that Matthew is right about Jesus, and Mark is wrong about Jesus. What do you then say Peter is actually more of an important person than James? No. Even though James, oh, 100%, because he was really... Yeah, but Paul, where, where, who? So what, what who? I mean, Sorry. Who, who was always seen as someone who is of prominence among the disciples. I'm not saying, it's difficult to say which one is higher than the other. Okay, maybe oh, no. James was no, the James, head of Jerusalem. No, James was the head of the church. In Jer no, but in Jerusalem. No, but so he wasn't a missionary. As opposed to where? So he wasn't a missionary. So I'm saying he no, wasn't a missionary. But, sorry, you when see? you say it's if Peter was the head of something else, what was so, Peter the head well, of? So can I just say, yeah, yeah. so when I was saying the point, is because he was someone who was with Jesus from the beginning until his resurrection and after. Yeah. So I'm saying James, we don't know if he was against Jesus. A lot of people say he was skeptical of Jesus' ministry when he was on earth. So I'm saying Paul is someone who's just as important. And then don't you see, sorry, not Paul, sorry, Peter. Um, Got some yeah, sorry, it's no mistake there. Um, yeah. Peter. So then you have to then say, was it Peter the first person to shift towards the Gentiles? Not Paul. Paul obviously carried it on a lot further, but it seems like Peter was the first one who actually made that move through that revelation he had. Um,